um, announcements, well, two messages really. The first is, um, if you are here for the first time or haven't been here for very long and the uh, worship freaked you out, can I just explain it a little bit? Um, so if you are next door at the football, you would um, know what was happening because at the football, whenever you know anything wonderful happens, everybody goes, yes, don't they? Well, they do in England anyway. And... Um, and actually, worship is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because some people worship totally silently, and it is very precious to them. Other people shout out. Other people raise their hands in worship to God. And um, so if it's difficult for you, um, it was really it freaked me out the first time I heard this kind of worship. But I've come to be one of the worst, I suppose, or best. So please do come and talk to me afterwards if it's a problem for you. The second um, notice is Elizabeth Bachmann, our dear Elizabeth, um, got very dizzy on Friday and then was sick and was taken into hospital. And Nick and I went to see her yesterday. And I think she had a, a TIA. Um, but they have been uh, monitoring her heart and they think that she'll be out tomorrow. But I wonder if we could just pray for them because, you know, dear Richard's not been well for ages now, Elizabeth. So could we pray? Lord, we thank you for this dear couple who mean a lot to us at River Life. They've given so much to your service. And we pray for Richard and Elizabeth to, tonight. We pray that you would meet with Elizabeth there in the hospital and your hand of healing would be upon her. We pray for Richard as he himself isn't well and is having to do more. Lord, we pray for your presence to be there in their home and that you would bless them and restore them to health. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, what amazing stories Jesus told, didn't he? And these three small stories um, are telling us one thing, and that's going to come up on the screen right now. It's simply saying God cares so much for his people who are lost. That is what God cares about. He cares for lost people, people who don't know him. And he will do literally anything to help them to find him again. And I don't know you or your Christian journey, or even if you have one, but um, perhaps you were brought up believing that if there was a God, he was angry. We, have, uh, we knew someone who worked in uh, the media, and he was quite often on television, and he said, you know, my friends in the media, they think that God's angry, if there is a God, because all they ever get is angry letters from Christians saying, you shouldn't be doing this. I felt really convicted, not that I'd sent them any ang angry letters, but it just felt sad that that was what we, we had given off, that God is angry. Maybe you're a perfectionist and you grew up thinking of God like a headmaster, you know, with a clipboard saying, could do better. Um, you know, the first two stories of these little series, this little series, they concentrate on something lost. The, the shepherd, you know, leaves 99 sheep and goes after the one that was lost. The woman, um, you probably know this, but when you got married in those days, you had a headdress put on you, and there were little gold coins all the way around the headdress, and it was your dowry. It was what you were given to take to your, your husband. It was your wealth. And so, of course, when she lost one of these coins, it was desperate, and she looked everywhere for it. And, uh, you know, what Jesus is saying, he's making a point, really, and he's saying God created us for that close walk with him, and he gave us his spirit so that we could reflect him to other people. But when we sin, when we do those things that hurt him, the connection with God is lost. You know, when you sin against another person, when you hurt another person, the connection gets lost, doesn't it? And so what Jesus is saying is something gets lost when we break a connection. And that is, of course, the reason why Jesus died on the cross, to deal with that broken connection between us and God and to pay the price for those sins. And I apologize to you if you've heard this story. I have told it here once before, but um, it's just a good illustration to me anyway of, of what Jesus was about. So when... Um, 
my daughter was very little. We were living in uh, London, and it seemed to me as though everybody else that I knew had perfect toddlers. You know, their, their little toddlers sort of walked along beside them and didn't do anything naughty. Mine, if I let go of her hand for a second, she boom, you know, straight into the road. She loved cars. And so everybody else had their perfect toddler walking beside them, and I practically had a ball and chain round Abby. I wouldn't let her go. So one day I had to go and pay um, a bill uh, in a car workshop. So I went in, closed the door behind me, put a chair against the door. I said, I'm sorry, my little girl runs away. And I started writing a check. When what happens to every mother at some point happened to me, it went really quiet. And I looked round, no toddler. I said, where's she gone? He says, oh, there's another door, bless him. So. I rushed out through the door, there's sparks flying everywhere, you know, no little girl. And I turned left, and there she was, racing for the busiest road in South London. It's called the South Circular. And it was right at the bottom of where we were, and she was running. And I screamed her name. She couldn't hear it, of course, because of all the noise. And I think I broke every record. I ran so fast, and I grabbed her as she was entering the, the traffic. You know, I grabbed her up. If she'd gone in, I'd have got between her and the cars. You know, any parent knows that you just do that. And on the way home, my heart was banging for such a long time. And God spoke to me. And, and he said, you know, the cross, my, the cross of Jesus was like that. It was me screaming, stop. You're going the wrong way. And it was my precious son putting his body between you and oncoming disaster. It was such a, an amazing illustration to me of what Jesus was doing when he did that. And I want for a few moments to concentrate on the third story. It's the best known story in the whole Bible, isn't it? And it's called, often, the prodigal son. But someone has said, we shouldn't call the story the prodigal son, we should call it the running father. Because it is about that father who is watching day after day for his son to return home. Now, I would have told you that I knew everything there was to know about the story of the prodigal son until this week, when I discovered something completely new. It's wonderful when you find these things in scripture. And uh, there's a missionary called Dr. Kenneth Bailey, and he's done a, a study on what the first century Middle Eastern people understood by Jesus' stories. And the truth is that a Middle Eastern man in those days never, ever ran. Never. Because to run, you had to pull up your, the skirts of your tunic and in that society, it was shameful, it was disgraceful to show bare legs. So an, a Middle Eastern man never ran. On the other hand, if a young man wasted his inheritance amongst the Gentiles, they had a little um, sort of ceremony that they did, the, the Jews. And when he came back to his hometown, the whole town gathered around him, they took a pot, they smashed it, and everyone shouted at the same time, you are broken off from this community. And so Dr. Bailey says this, why did the father run? He endured disgrace and shame to stop his son from the humiliation and the disgrace that he would have had from the family. And you know, that's why Jesus died also, we have these sort of, I think, rather reverent pictures of Jesus on the cross, but actually he was completely naked on the cross. He endured that shame, that disgrace, so that you and I do not have to endure it. Isn't that an incredible thing? All right, they're all with me. Um, when, uh, when Nick and I, during that time, when we were in London, we used to have a... Um, an international student group that met in our house every Friday night. And we had an Afghan guy um, who was in our group. And he had suffered probably more than anybody here. His mother and his sister, and I think one of his brothers, had been murdered by an opposing party. 
And he joined what was then the Mujahideen, which was the sort of precursor to the jihadist groups that we have nowadays. And it was a very um, violent group, the Mujahideen. And um, he killed a number of people. He was a young lad, but he was getting revenge for his mother and his sister. And he was delightful. We loved him. He was great fun, but you, he never showed any emotion. He would never, you couldn't get very far with this young man. Well, one night, we had invited everybody to bring a story from their hometown, from their home country. And we all sat around on the, the carpet telling our stories. And Nick and I had agreed to say, Jesus told this story. And then we would just tell the story of the prodigal son. We wouldn't explain it any more than Jesus did, actually. We would just tell the story. And uh, Nick sort of made it a little bit more modern. But he said, Jesus told this story, and he began to tell it. And when it got to the point where the father starts to run, I looked up, and this Afghan guy had the tears rolling down his face. And I spoke to him afterwards, and for that moment anyway, he understood it doesn't matter how bad what you've done is, it doesn't matter how bad it is, the moment you repent, you turn back and you start to come home, the father begins to run. And um, there's a, there ought to be a very beautiful picture of the running father up there. So um, let's look at the three, uh, the three characters in this story. So first of all, we're going to look at the, the younger son. You know, all that the father owned belonged to that younger son. All the teaching, the training, the privilege, the love, the attention, the, the chance to be a special member of the family. And you know what the problem was? The problem was it was just not enough. Somehow it was not enough for him. And you know, the moment that we stop being grateful, everything becomes a restriction, doesn't it? And uh, you know, the younger son ends up eating pig food. <laughs> and uh, we need to listen to the younger son because when he got home, I don't think it was the food or the presents that got to him. I think it was the father's face, a face that only ever looked at him in love. The father would have looked at him in discipline and in sorrow often, but never without love. You know, and he says to the father, can I have my inheritance now? Which was pretty much saying, I wish you were dead and I could have the money now, please. And, you know, in his haste to enjoy the world, he goes off to people who look at him with lust. They look at him with calculation. And in the end, they look at him with disgust, but they never look at him with unfailing love. And that's a challenge for us, I think. You know, because if you know the Father tonight, how honored are you that the God of the universe wants to spend time with you? What does being a Christian mean to you? Does it mean going to church on Sundays? You know, does it mean getting your theology right? Or does it mean knowing a father yourself? And, um, you know, if you don't know God as your own heavenly father, you know, again, we often say, what's stopping you? <laughs> because, you know, he has been calling after you so long. I made you, I lost you, come on home. And, um, you know, uh, uh, we were telling some people last night that uh, we've been married 40 years this month, and we went for a 40-year anniversary, and it was a disaster. Um, we went to Venice, and it poured with rain, and if you know Venice, it really, there's no point in going to Venice in the bucketing rain. And uh, Nick got an ear infection, and uh, we just came, came home in the end. Uh, <laughs> but we have a wonderful marriage, so really it's, it doesn't matter that the anniversary didn't go so well. But there's one person I love more than Nick, and he knows about it, it's okay. Um, and that is, is God, you know, and it's not just, I don't just, I'm not just a Christian who goes to church. I really love God because I've known him all my life and I've known him do amazing things for me. And, you know, uh, I, that's why we have these services, these taster services, because we want you to know his extraordinary love this evening as well. 
So that's the younger son. Then let's look at the older brother, because the older brother, you know, was just as wasteful as the younger one. You know, all that love and opportunity and privilege is for the older brother as well as the younger one. And guess what he sees? It's all hard work and duty. Is that how you see your Christian life? I have met people who do. And, you know, he's, he says, I've been doing all this stuff for the father, you know. And he goes off and he behaves badly and he gets forgiven and even rewarded. And, you know, it's not in the Bible, but I'm convinced that he also said, and technically, you know, that cow that they've just slaughtered, that belongs to me, because he had his half. You know, and the father says, so why didn't you enjoy it then? Everything I've got belongs to you. And, you know, um, we, can, we can be full of good works, you and I. We can be full of good works and we can still be as dried up and bitter as that young man. It's perfectly possible. Um, Nicky Gumbel is the uh, vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton in the centre of London. And he was asked to take his funeral a little while ago. Now, it was the funeral of a lady um, who lived on the streets. She used to carry everything she owned in two plastic bags. And he said he knew all the street people around Holy Trinity Brompton, and lots of them were delightful, and he had a good relationship with them. But this lady, if you even smiled at her, you know, she started cursing you and shouting. She was a really angry woman. So he went to the funeral thinking nobody would turn up. He, didn't, he assumed nobody would turn up. To his amazement, the place is full of very wealthy, nicely dressed people, and he discovered that this woman owned an apartment in central London, and that is serious money. She had extremely expensive um, paintings and all sorts of stuff that she, that she owned. And he turned to one of the guys and he said, why did she do that then? Why did she live on the streets? And the guy said, you know, I don't know. I think she just got used to living like that. You know, and the young, the older brother, you know, he is living like a pauper. He's got all that stuff, and he's got the father's love, and he's still all dried up and bitter, and, you know, I've done all this for you, and I've got nothing. And I feel so sorry for him, because I've been there. You know, I've been, you know, I've been there as a Christian worker, feeling thoroughly used and abused. When there's a feast to be had from God the Father every day of our life. And then finally, let's look at the, the running father, you know, because he is so generous, God, you know, to choose a planet and lavish on it, you know, all the beauty of life and vegetation and, um, you know, throw it away on a creature that's going to ruin it. And he took part of himself, you know, his only son, and has him banged up on a Roman cross so that forgiveness could be there for us forevermore. That is about as generous as it gets, isn't it? And, you know, we hold on to our little life, don't we? And we're not generous with our time or our praise or our love. And we end up eating pig food, like his son. And so... This is just a very brief talk tonight. I'm going to end with a, another story, but I want to ask us three questions. And there are questions about what we do, what we're doing with our life. So first of all, let's, not, let's be careful not to waste all the love and attention that God lavishes on us. You know, don't waste it tonight. Are you walking with God? What is your Christian life about is it about what you do on Sundays? Or are you walking with God? Do you make, make use of the wonderful gift of his time and attention and his wisdom? But on the other hand, let's be thoroughly and hilariously generous with all the stuff that we have. Our time, our love, our abilities, our gifting. Let's just spend it on God and his people, you know, because he spends all his on us. We can be free to give so generously of our lives. Are you doing that? And then thirdly, 
You know, if you haven't yet bowed the knee before God the Father, it might be time. You know, God may have been speaking to you for a long time. And uh, maybe this is your moment when God is saying to you, this is your time, come on home. Turn back home. So I'm going to read to you now, and then we will finish, but I'm going to read you uh, a modern uh, prodigal story. But it's not about a guy, it is about uh, a prodigal daughter. A young girl grows up on a uh, cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents are a bit old-fashioned, and they object to her nose ring and the music she listens to and the length of her skirts. I hate you, she screams at her father one night as he knocks on her door after an argument. And that night she acts on a plan that she's mentally rehearsed many times. She runs away. She's visited Detroit only once before. But because the newspapers in Traverse City report in detail the gangs, the drugs, the violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes that it's the, probably the last place her parents will look for her. California, maybe. Florida, but not Detroit. On her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, and arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. The good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with the big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. Since she's underage, they pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about her folks back home, but their lives seem so boring and provincial now, she can hardly believe she grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with the headline, Have You Seen This Child? But by now she has blonde hair, and with all the makeup and body piercing jewelry, nobody would mistake her for a child. Besides, most of her friends are runaways and nobody squeals in Detroit. After a year, the first signs of sickness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days we can't mess around, he says, and before she knows it, she's on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks a night, but they don't pay much, and all the money goes to feed her drug habit. When winter blows in, she finds, her, finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside big department stores. Sleeping's the wrong word. A teenage girl in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark circles come under her eyes, and her cough worsens. One night, as she lies away, wake, listening for footsteps, all of a sudden, everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl, lost and cold in a frightening city. And she begins to whimper. Her po pockets are empty, and she's hungry, and she needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her, and something jolts a memory of May in Traverse City with a million cherry trees in blossom and her golden retriever dog dashing through the rows of trees chasing a tennis ball. God, why did I leave, she says. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She is sobbing. She knows in a flash more than anything else she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls home. Three connections with the answer phone. She hangs up the first two times, but after the third time, she says, Dad, Mum, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way tomorrow. It'll get there at midnight. If you're not there, I guess I'll stay on the uh, bus until Canada. It takes about seven hours to, for the bus to make the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and missed the message? Maybe she should have waited. Even if they're home, they probably thought she was dead long ago. She should have given them time to overcome their shock. Her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech she's preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over. 
When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing, the driver announces in a crackly voice, 15 minutes, folks. 15 minutes is all we've got. She checks herself in her mirror, smooths her hair, and licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice if they're there. She walks into the terminal, not knowing what to expect, and not one of the thousands of scenes that have played out in her mind prepare her for what she sees. There in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal of Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 family members. Brothers, sisters, great aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmother, even a great grandmother. They're all wearing ridiculous looking party hats and blowing noisemakers and taped across the entire wall is a computer generated banner saying, welcome home. Out of the crowd steps her father. She looks through her tears and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry. I know he interrupts her. Hush, child, we've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet is waiting for you at home. That's so beautiful because it's exactly the story that Jesus tells, isn't it? And so I want to pray for us tonight, and I want to start by just leaving a little bit of space so that you can talk to God yourself. Maybe um, you know that it's time for you to turn and say, God, I'm so sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry. I want to come to you tonight. Maybe you ha are a Christian. Maybe you've known him for a long time, but you haven't really had a relationship with him. And this is your time to just be real with him and say, God, I want to come on home and have a relationship. Let's just have a few moments. Lord, we want to thank you that there isn't a single thing too bad that we have done that we cannot come back to you. We thank you so much that the moment that we turn in repentance, Lord, you start to run. And we thank you for taking on the humiliation, as it were, of running to us so that we wouldn't go through the shame of our sin. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you. We never think of how shameful it was for you to, to be on the cross with it completely naked on our behalf. Lord, we thank you so much. And we say sorry, Lord, for those things that have hurt you. And we're sorry that we run after so many things that just don't satisfy and we want to take time to enjoy being a son or a daughter of yours. Lord, we're sorry that we take your passionate love for granted. And Lord, right now we want to say we just turn back to you and we say we want relationship with a father like that. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen.